All right. Since just uh, 10 of us in class, so let's start and be done with it and be quick and uh, that's it. So, uh, what's the hoopla about all C++'s new versions? Like, um, now we are talking about C++ 11, 14, 17, 20, so is when they're talking about these versions of C++, what's being added? Is the syntax different? Is what is being added to the, to the system? The thing is that uh, the language is the same. They just try to make it safer. When we say safer is that uh, the fact is that anything that is added to C++, um, it's just... Um, implementations of uh, safety features using C++ itself. So there's like every single new thing that you learn about C++, you, you will see that you can implement it yourself. Manual. It's like when we done a um, string header file in IPC, uh, we actually uh, created the string copy ourselves and we see it's just a loop. We create the str length for itself, and it's, we see it's just a loop to the null, and things like that. We see that um, all the features that are added to the language are not necessarily complicated things, but common things that needs to be done because they are being used a lot. When it goes higher you know, in C++, in higher versions of C++, they are trying to add to the safety of the language. Now, what is the safety of the, lan of the language? C++ has, has mind of it so in many things. Uh, for example, when we write the graph back there, when you write something like integer A and you write double B, and you log long C. You write C is equal to A plus B. Will this give you an error? No, it won't, right? So what is it doing now? We say, okay, we have an A and an integer, right? And B is a double, so we learn that when something like that happens, it casts the small one to a double, right? Therefore, a plus B will be a double, then it's going to be casted back to a long and put in C, right? All right. So things like this happen. Language has mind of its own on these things. But what if I don't want that to happen? What if I want the outcome of A plus B to be an integer? Not only that, many more things that are like, oh, we know that I can actually cast this thing to an integer and the whole story becomes different. Now there's no double over here. There are two integers and an integer will be casted to a long. Well, long story short, that we, we need to be able to, they added features to C++ and went to C++ 11, 14, 17, and 20 to to add safety features in it, which means all the things that meant a big variety of stuff that are supposed to happen, and the compiler does it automatically. Like when you are doing casting, like if I do something like this, integer pointer A is equal to one, two, three. If I write something like this, what does it mean? You see it's actually giving me yeah, an error. That's not an error. I want, let's make it more realistic. So one, two, eight, okay? So if I write something like that, what does that mean? Can anybody tell me? Oh, let's, let's do it like this. Everybody's looking at it as I wrote something complicated. Let me make it bigger so we understand what's going on. Is everybody okay with this? So what does this do? To 128, 128, right? A becomes 128. What does this do? Initializes A to 128, right? What does this do? 
initializes A to 128, right? So A will have 128. Now, what does this do? Initializes A to 128, which means A will have 128 in it. What does it mean? It means the address A is pointing to 128th memory location, byte in memory, right? But they're all the same. But this one's giving me an error. If I did that 10 years ago, I wouldn't get any error. It would tell me you're good. Why? Because they would think that you are casting an integer to an integer pointer. Essentially, you want to make it a thing. But if you didn't want that, the compiler says, this is very unusual. Are you sure you want to do that? Now, of course, I can do something like this over here. and kind of clarify what I want to do. This is how we did it in C. But C++ is going even further, which means it tells you, I'll give you a specific type of casts that I written it as templates. So it essentially does this. It essentially does this. But you need to use a specific one based on what you want to do. So I can give you a proper error message if what you asked is not what you get. You follow what I'm saying? OK, so if I want to do something like this, so these two statements, they look the same, right? But, but they're two absolutely different things. The integer is related to double. They are same things. They are primitive values, right? They are a location in memory with that the bits are set to certain thing, and, and they, they are supposed to hold numbers, correct? Where line 3 is a completely different thing. Line 3, you are changing the, the whole 128 to something new because 128 is an integer you add one to an integer one will be added to it a pointer is not an integer it's something freaky you add one to it it adds the target to it it points to a location it's not a variable it's a it's a it's a variable but its job is completely different with primitive values so essentially in the first one what you are doing you are casting two static things together in the second one, you're completely reinterpreting the, the meaning of 128. You're telling to the compiler. So that's exactly what you do when you are dealing with that, with, with the compiler. So in here, instead of, uh, let me just. So now in C++, in uh, newer versions of C++, they say if you want a cast to be between related stuff, two things that are almost the same and you just want to change their types, what you do is a static cast. And then you write over here what the cast is going to be. I want it to be casted to an integer. And then you put the value you want over there. So therefore, that double will be casted to an integer. If I write any other type of cast, it's going to give me an error. Because this two things are related. In here, if I say static cast, cast, integer pointer, One twenty-eight. That's not happening because you are reinterpreting the thing. In here, it has to be you follow? So, how does this make the language safe? You will not write one thing thinking something is going to happen when another thing happens. Like this, you mention what you want, and if it doesn't, if, if that thing is not what you want, it gives you a warning. 
Therefore, you're not going to have a bug. Okay? So what are these casts? These are called constraint casts. Okay? These are called constraint casts. And we have four different types of them. Related types. Static casts. I just mentioned it to you. Unrelated types. The types that have nothing to do with each other. Reinterpret. The other one is called constant cast. Now, what the heck is a constant cast? Let's say I have a class over here. Something. Okay, I have a class number. And in here, I have some, some value in here. Okay? All right? And I, I want to print this function so we know how, how we print it, right? Correct? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, it's here. Correct? This is what we do. Right? No, it's not always. I can change this. I can put F stream over here. It's going to print in a file. C out is, is, I put that C out over there so I, so I can conveniently call print with no argument and it becomes C out. So if I don't mention anything, it's C out. But I can change it to whatever I want. Okay? So, and you know that we have to put this thing as const. Why? Because print is not supposed to change the data. Correct? But what if I ask you, I want you to add a, a query to this, like this. Size T, number of prints. And I want you to have a variable that keep track of how many times you printed a number. How can you do that? You're going to say, I'm going to, every time I print, I'm going to add one to the size T number of prints, right? Right? That's easy. Okay, so let's do it. So in here, I'm going to say, correct? No. Because I made this a constant, I cannot change. So should I remove the constant? You shouldn't, because logic says print. So what am I supposed to do? When something like this happens, I know that print is not supposed to change anything in this class other than number of prints, correct? So I can remove that constantness. What can I do? I can do something like this. I can say integer pointer number of prints, let's call it, is equal to constant cast to an integer pointer. It's const or constant? It's const cast or constant? It's const. So const cast integer pointer address of m number of prints. And now I can say target of NOP plus plus. What the devil happened over here? It can. Must cast. Oh, sorry. Size T. I know. Poor thing is telling me that, hey, you cannot change the type. It's supposed to remove constantness. Okay, there you go. Uh, sorry, I put integer. So what you can do, you can change an address that is constant to a non-constant. You can remove the constantness with this constant cast. It's a very dangerous thing to do, right? 
That's why you have to do it this way so the compiler knows what you're doing. So I'm telling to the compiler, hey, take the address of this. I can do that, right? I can take the address of anything. I'm not changing it, right? I'm going to say change the, this constant address of mine and make it non-constant and put it in here. Therefore, NOP is the address of that one, but read-write. Now I can add one to it. So constant cast removes constantness from an address if you need it. Pardon me? No, it's not. No. See, the print is not supposed to change any data of number that is not, it's not supposed to change the number. But by definition, I want to know how many times it printed it. So I need to change only one thing, but no, nothing else. So constantness, nothing is absolute in real life. Right? Nothing is absolute. You can, you can make something not change, but few things sh should change. You know what I mean? So you want to make it constant, which means you can now have a constant pointer of this thing pass to something and still print it. And it will just change the part that you want, but nothing else has changed. I know it's very unusual, hence the unusual casting. So it gives you the power to do what you want to do. OK? That's constant cast. Because I said, because I not only, yeah, I, if it was an int, it would have worked. Then I had to, <laughs> if I put a reinterpret, if I put this one inside a reinterpret cast, I could have done that. <laughs> you don't want, yeah. So. Because I, I made a mistake instead of a site. But that's, it is, this is a beautiful thing, actually. It, it helps you a lot. Now, the next one, let's say it, you have, you know that, uh, like, say I have a, uh, a vehicle as a, as a class. And out of vehicle, I create a motorcycle and a car and a boat. OK, I, I created three classes out of vehicle, correct? I can always downcast the car to a vehicle, right? Can I cast the vehicle to a car? Because a, 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 a vehicle may be a boat. Right? Maybe you have vehicle is equal to new boat. Now if you cast the vehicle to a car, it's going to be a disaster, right? Okay. But sometimes in programming you need to. Sometimes in programming you are writing a logic and you are 100% sure that when you follow this logic, the vehicle will hold the car. Got it? Sometimes you write a code that in different pieces of code, in first part of the code, you know vehicle is going to be a boat. In the second part of the code, you know vehicle is going to be a motorcycle. And in the third part of the code, you know vehicle is going to be a car. Right? And you want to have four passengers in the vehicle at that stage. You can't because it's, you don't know what a vehicle doesn't relate to a car. Vehicle could be any of these, right? Vehicle could be a boat with 100 people in it. Vehicle could be a motorcycle with two people on it. Or vehicle would be a car with four people on it, right? So how can you cast a vehicle to a car at the place of your code that you, when you follow the logic, you know 100% at this part of the if statement, <laughs> My vehicle is a car. How can you do that? That's a dynamic cast. So you can upcast a vehicle to a car 
when needed using dynamic cast. So you can do a down cast, obvious that there's no problem, but up cast is the one that is uh, kind of crazy. Okay, so if the example is over there, it actually shows that you have a base class with all the good stuff that it has. And as you see, it, it does a dynamic cast. You have the Y of D, and you can dynamic down. That's perfect. Okay, but if you do it the other way, which one was it? Yeah, you see in here, it's doing a dynamic cast of base and put it in drive, which means you can do that. In reality, you can't do that. When you just put a regular thing, you can't do that. You cannot have a base and cast it to a derive, but with this statement, you can. The other way is obvious. Obviously, if you do it, you know nothing's going to go wrong because you just, you, can, you just can do it normally. Okay? But with this one, you can do it. But you have to make sure if the logic is not right, then you're going to get an error. So it tells you exactly what happens. So this type of casts are very useful. Dynamic cast, I didn't have anything over here to explain, to, to, to show you anything with. You're going to use this in 3, 4, 5. That's why it's at the end of the thing. And uh, in the test, like if I give you something, my worst thing I'm going to give you maybe a, a, some concept question of this or uh, give you a constant cast to do, something that you can, or a re reinterpret cast to do. Some, you know what, something very simple. Um, these are used in 3, 4, 5 a lot. So you'll see that you're going to. So from now on, if you want to do casting, use these to see if you're actually doing a proper cast. Or, so that's that. It's uh, simple and straightforward. Uh, that's that one. And the final thing we want to talk about today is the overview of polymorphism to see exactly what polymorphism, all the things that we learned, how do they categorize them, and why and how things happen. So read all these things yourself to, to know what the history is, but I'm going to tell you what we are dealing with now. This is what we are dealing with. Polymorphism has uh, two major categories. One is ad hoc, the other one is universal. I'll call the ad hoc fake polymorphism, okay? And I call the universal real polymorphism. That's the name that I put on it so I can remember it. A fake polymorphism is a polymer is the type of a polymorphism that when you are writing it, it looks like polymorphism. But when you look at it closely to see how it's implemented, you see it's not polymorphism at all. Like, for example, the casting I gave you an example for. You can write... A plus B, A can be an integer, B can be a double. So plus works with an integer and a double. Right? Is that polymorphism? No, it's casting. It is casting something so it can work. Right? So the very first type of polymorphism that is fake, but it looks like polymorphism, is casting. That's called coercion. So casting looks like polymorphism, but it's not. Okay? That's coercion. The second one. When you overload a function, what do you do? You write function print, it accepts an integer, then you write another function print, it accepts a double. And you say it's polymorphic because print is doing the things in two different ways, right? No, the name is not print. The compiler actually gets the argument type and attaches it to the name. So behind the scene, calls the print, print int. And for the, the other one, behind the scene, without you knowing, when it compiles it, called the other one, print double. Or if you have uh, the one that prints a character and an int, the other one becomes print char int. So th it changes the name. You don't see it, but behind the scene, function overloading is nothing but uh, attaching the types to the name. That's overloading. Again, fake polymorphism. When you look at it closely, it is not polymorphism. It, it looks that way, which is fine. It's still polymorphism. It's just 
fake. Where, uh, if, with a closer scrutiny, you will see that, no, it's not. But the other side, this one, is completely polymorphic. Why? Virtual functions. With virtual functions, you are overriding a function. The function signatures are identical. You are saying car, drive. You are saying boat, drive. If you come back, you say vehicle, drive. You don't care if it's a boat or a, boat or a car. Automatically, the proper one is going to be selected. So you can say vehicle, drive, and the outcome could be flying. So all the functions and everything are identical, but the calls at the end will be selected based on the type that you are using, all the virtuals that you use. That's inclusion. That's real polymorphism. And mother of all polymorphism, polymorphism uh, uh, real polymorphism, is templates. That you don't even have a function. You just write the logic for it. Compiler creates the logic for you on demand. Now we learned only function templates, but you can actually, you'll learn in 3, 4, 5, we're going to do class templates. So you're going to create a class, and you will see, like, all the things, like, s some of you used vectors and stuff in your assignment, I have no idea why, but, but things like that. You will see that you can actually create amazing arrays, things that, or m things that any logic, any algorithm, any structure that you think is unsafe in C, like you're talking about an array, right? There is an STL standard template library for that. It's called actually an array. You can create an array of integers, and it's a safe array. You cannot overwrite. You cannot. Uh, uh, you can resize it easily. You have vector that is a perfect array. You have a queue. You have a DQ. Many things. Any algorithm that you can think of. You want to sort something? There is a sort algorithm for it. So you simply say sort. And you put whatever you want to sort. If you want to search for something, you can create an algorithm. Uh, you can call the algorithm for search. And not only that, you can actually tell it, do the search for me in a parallel, which means it actually breaks down the, uh, the search into pieces and gives it in four CPUs so it runs faster. So all these things are in. Remember, I don't know if you know that. Old times, we had this thing with Apple, this slogan with Apple. It says, you want this? There is an app for that. You want to do that? There is an app for that. It was a thing that was, it was a slogan. In C++, anything you want to do, there is a template for that. There is an SDL template for that, anything you want to do. And it will do what you want to do much more efficient than you do it manually yourself. Like if you want to do a sort, write a bubble sort, no, call this the SDL sort. It will do the sort hundreds of times faster than your logic. And it does it in parallel. So, so parametric polymorphism templates are the best. And, and, we, uh, and they don't even exist. You write a function. If you don't use it, it's not even in your code. As soon as you call, it will create the compiler, will create the logic for you and add it to your executable. And it could be different types or anything. You just write one logic, it applies to all different types. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's that. So um, go through this in detail, read it, and next day you come with questions. Um, that's the end of OP244. We're done. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> it's a beautiful day today. Snow. Snow is beautiful. As my friend says over there, snow is beautiful when it comes, but two days later, when it becomes dirt and black thing, that's not good anymore. Okay, let me pause this thing and see if you have any questions, and then we're going to...